Good morning to everyone. Yes, sir. I am blowing this microphone up and breathing all in. I apologize. Uh, lesson 13, that's page 70. It's entitled, Why He is the Good Shepherd. In our study of the verses this morning, they rely very heavily on uh, metaphors and imagery. In this specific text this morning, um, it's actually an agrarian or shepherd imagery, shepherd metaphors. And we know that Jesus often taught using metaphors and what? Parables. Correct, parables. A parable is what? Somebody blurred out the definition of a parable. A simple story used to illustrate or convey a moral or spiritual lesson also known as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Then what is a metaphor? Comparison of two things. Says the correct, very right, says the English teacher. Um, something used to represent something else. Something used to represent something else and not a literal manner. The lesson text starts in John chapter 10 and it's verses 7 through 18 but I believe we should start at the beginning of the chapter so chapter 10 verse 1 very truly I tell you Pharisees anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep Verse 3, the gatekeeper or the porter opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So who's he talking to? Right here. Pharisees. Again, we're seeing where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. What was the... Somebody remind us what was the deal with the Pharisees. What, what was the deal with the Pharisees? What... Why were they a thorn in Jesus' side? They tried to trap him up, kiss him in a you know. Yes, they were, but I mean, why were they like that? They did not believe that he was the Son of God. They were respected in the earthly kingdom. Yes, they were tied up in the earthly things and not the spiritual things. They were they missed the forest for the trees. They saw Jesus and saw, we talked before, where Jesus would sleep on the hills but had nowhere to lay his head. These were finely dressed, well uh, ordained people. Hmm? She said and they liked it that way. Uh, yes, yes, and they did like it that way. So verse 10, Verily I tell you Pharisees, he's talking to the Pharisees, Um, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Thief and a robber is reference to Satan, false teachers, and here most definitely the Pharisees. That's uh, Jesus speaking, putting a bullseye right on the Pharisees. the pen by the gate. The gate is the legitimate way. And compare that to the illegitimate way, which is not through any way other than through the gate. So, like I said, we're using a metaphor this morning with uh, it's agrarian metaphor, shepherd imagery. Who is the flock that are the sheep here? Christians, the church, the body. 
So, what we're getting at right in verse 1 is laid out. There is only one way into the place where the flock is. And the flock are Christians, the church, the saved. And they can only get there through the shepherd. Verse 2. <clears throat> the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 3. The porter, or the gatekeeper, opens the gate for him, that is, for the shepherd. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. At the very end of that verse, he said he leads them out. That leading by example is not forcing someone to do something. It is not driving them out, it's not corralling them out. He leads by example. Verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Anybody ever been around sheep? A bunch of sheep before. Are they quiet? No, <laughs> they're not. They're very loud. They're very vocal. They, um, that's how they communicate. So they also know the sound of their master or the shepherd. There is a story that I stumbled across that in World War I, I believe it was, a couple of soldiers tried to steal an entire flock of sheep. And they didn't have, you know, they weren't picking them up and throwing them in a truck. They were trying to corral and force the entire flock of sheep with them so they could steal them. Well, the shepherd was somewhere else, and when he came around where his flock was supposed to be and saw them being driven off, he could not force the soldiers to give him the sheep back, but all he did was call to them, and they came back. And the, and the soldiers couldn't do anything about it. So, a good shepherd leads. They do not force. Verse number five, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Why didn't the Pharisees get it? The Pharisees never get it. Why didn't they understand? Exactly. This is simple. Anybody can understand it. Jesus, you... I, also thought that maybe the maybe the Pharisees are literally that that far gone, and, and not as far as the agrarian society. They don't even deal with people who deal with sheep. That was possible, but this is simple. Anybody could understand it. Yes, sir. The man, you're right. The man is so close to what he was saying, regardless of what he was saying. Mm -hmm. They were not here. Yeah, they're, once again, they just their hearts were hardened. They were the hard ground. They refused to hear this. And as we're going to see, there are plenty of examples in the Old Testament that reference the shepherd. So, Pharisees were learned individuals. They were not stupid. They knew this stuff, but they just weren't opening their minds to to accept it. Well, they were used to following them. Yeah. They like the power. And... Yep. They wanted. I learned a lot of people today. You, you get your mind set on this got to be this way. Mm -hmm. And you can show them half a dozen different ways to do it. Like he's showing them, you know, y'all can set up that I'm going to do this, but I'm not. This is what I'm, and they're not going to leave. It's got to be their way. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't lead by, they didn't lead at all, in short. They weren't the example for the flock to follow. They were trying to drive the flock. <clears throat> verse number seven, beginning of our actual verses this morning. Therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate or the door for the sheep. We've said this before, like when you see a verse that says something in the next verse that says, again, I tell you, 
here we have like six or seven verses that get repeated. Somebody was really missing the point, and Jesus had to restate the entire argument. Um, we can't read the tone here. I don't know. I'm kind of of the mind that Jesus' tone became a little bit more stern in these verses, the second set around. That's just not big enough. Therefore, Jesus said again, Verily I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, the gate, the door, the path, the way. John 4, 16. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse number 8. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. As we said, the sheep are followers of who? The shepherd. Sheep follow the shepherd. The shepherd here is Jesus. Thieves and robbers, again, are the false teachers, Pharisees, Satan, anybody other than the true way. Um, the sheep have not listened to them, or the false teachers. The sheep didn't and won't follow a false shepherd. So once again, this is a bullseye being placed upon the Pharisees, or a shot across the bow, so to speak. Were the Pharisees really there to learn from Jesus, or to hear what he was saying at all? No. So if they weren't really there to learn, who is Jesus really speaking to here? Hmm? Yes. So... The more I read this, this was a thought. You can tell two people the exact same thing. And two people that are of complete different mindsets. And one person takes it at face value and the other person takes it wrong. When I first, when I've read, I've read these verses a million times. When I first read these verses, I didn't see it from any point of view other than the Christians. You see it and say, oh, Jesus is the good shepherd, you accept that, and that's comforting. When you say that to somebody who is of the opposite mindset and say the exact same words in the same way, you get a complete opposite effect. That's what's going on here. <clears throat> Verse number 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. They will go in. Go into where? His kingdom, his body. Correct. His kingdom, his body, a place of safety. So they will go in somewhere where they will be safe. Well, if they're going to go in, why are they going to go right back out again? What's that mean? They're going to go out and find pasture. For sustenance. Correct. So they come in to the body where they will be safe. They go out and find pasture. What um, what do sheep do when they go out to pasture? They feed. They eat. So, no. uh, you know, he mentioned the same thing in verse seven in a way that uh, he is the door. Mm -hmm. And sheep always get come in through him. And the same thing in verse nine, he is the door. You know, it be the other way. You come in, it's not right. It, it, it's not going to stay. Yeah. You know. He is the only way. We're going to see that. I mean, it's already been said, just like you brought out. It's He's the exclusive way. There is no other way. When they go out and find pasture, sheep feed. So in this metaphor, sheep feed for food, for sustenance. Well, if we're the sheep, we're talking spiritually, what sustenance are we supposed to... What are we supposed to sustain ourselves on? Yes. The knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. The word of God. This might have reminded someone else of Psalm 23. They will come in and go out and find pasture. They'll find green pastures and still waters. Who is the shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Did the Pharisees know Psalm 23? Yes. I will lie down beside what? Green pastures. Did Pharisees know Psalm 23? Yes. 
and besides still waters. Did the Pharisees <clears throat> and these scholarly uh, Jews and everybody that was giving Jesus a hard time on this, did they know Psalm 23? Yes. Yeah. But how come in verse 6 it said they did not understand what he was telling them? There's a degrees of understanding. They refused to understand. They were immature. It's, it's, like our children, sometimes our children will try uh, little psychological games on us. No. Like we don't know. We don't understand <laughs> what you're trying to do here. Well, such and such let her child go. Where such, you know. <laughs> Oh, we know that. We know to call up and follow up on that. But they thought they were smarter than Jesus, please. But they yeah. kept doing this over and over. It's like they never learned. They're always trying to ensnare and trap him. Yeah. So they're playing this little psychological game. So they truly were unlearned. They really did not know. Because they were never going to be smarter than Jesus. <coughs> it's like our children will never be smarter than us. Especially five in their team that they think they know. Yes. <laughs> I have a <clears throat> Corbin's three and a half, so we're working on potty training. I'm not going to tell the entire story, but if y'all want to ask afterward, I'll tell y'all that I have no idea. And he's like, I have no idea. Yeah. Y'all, somebody asked me one on one about that, where children think they're going to get something over on you. <laughs> They knew this, but again, Jesus, this, our whole study this quarter is Jesus the master teacher. There are people learning from this, even if there's other folks standing around. That's, you ever been in a situation where somebody is obviously wrong or just not grasping it, and you're, you're a third party over here, you're standing off to the side, and there's somebody telling them the truth, the real deal, what's going on, and everybody behind them knows, and they just don't get it. And you feel like you just kind of want to slink away. Like, I don't want to be around y'all. Y'all are just not. That's what's going on here. It's terrible to see. <clears throat> Verse number 10. The thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and to have it to the full or have it more abundantly. The thief, again, Satan, false teachers, anyone but the true way that they may have life and have it more abundantly, not, when we say life, we're not talking about just to preserve life. Jesus came to impart life, to impart eternal life, to have it more abundantly. So this popped into my mind since I'm a night owl and I'm up at crazy hours and there's paper, or not paid, where they buy segments of TV and it's the reverend so-and-so and it's the this and it's the that. y'all, what kind of more abundantly are we talking about? We talking about worldly stuff. We talking about preachers when they say, "Put your hands on the TV and you'll be blessed." And somebody here, have y'all seen the prayer oil stuff that gets sold? <clears throat> if you give us money and donate, then you'll get a prayer oil, and something good will happen in your life. We're not talking about worldly abundance. We're talking about spiritual, not worldly. Verse number eleven: I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. For the sheep. Other than taking that at surface value, that's also a comparative saying that they're not the good sheep, that they won't sacrifice themselves. Um, there is only one, exactly. Um, <clears throat> we said this is a, a comparative, and we hit on this a little bit ago. The bad shepherd, the false shepherd, thinks that the flock <coughs> exists for his benefit. That's what thieves and robbers believe. They push and move the people, or think they do, for their benefit, not for the benefit of the church. <coughs> but the good shepherd lives, and not just lives, but dies for the good of the sheep. In verse number 11, Jesus states this emphatically and in the way he said it and the way it is meant to be taken, the good shepherd 
the one, the only good shepherd that's exclusive to Jesus, as he said earlier in verse 8. Verse number 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. <clears throat> then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The hired hand, since we're talking in a metaphor here, the hired hand is who? The Pharisees. The um, Pharisees. Or anyone who was in a position of religious leadership at the day. Right there in verse 12, Jesus is literally telling them that he is the master and they are the hirelings. But to take that literally, how many of us have known people in like, especially in a job, you work at a small business, <laughs> the people that <clears throat> are just hired on, it's five o'clock, it's time to go. Where's the boss? The boss is still on the job. The boss doesn't leave. When it's said and done, who, who is the one or who is the person that takes the most ownership of something? The person that the thing belongs to. So the one that it truly belongs to is the one who takes ownership. Uh, if I'm just a hired hand, I'm going to drop my things and run when I see trouble. If I see trouble, I'm gone. I'm like, this is not mine. You know, what if a storm's coming or a tornado's coming? I got my own problem in my house. This is the boss's problem. I'm gone. <clears throat> but if it's mine to protect, then I will take charge of it and I will take it head on. What are we seeing Jesus do? Just that. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So... Who do we all belong to? While we were still sinners. People say, it's my life, it's my choice, it's my... It's not. You've already been bought and paid for. And people say that all the time. Oh, yes, they do. I have a right to not go to nature. I have a right to let you know. I mean, why are we talking about this? I've got plenty. Yeah. Let's try that on the job and see how that works. And I really hear that in college. I have a right to abortion if I want it. I have a right to do this today. Mm-hmm. Try that, try that on the job. Go to an 8 to 5 job and tell your boss, the master. Yeah. In, in this example, we're talking about shepherds and sheep. Let's talk about business owners and you just work for them. I got the right to not do that. You got the right to not work here. Yeah. You you kinda don't. <clears throat> and that's the ultimate answer when I have a right not to go to church mm -hmm. or not to worship. Well, you have the right to not get to heaven. You know, I mean yeah. bluntly as the boss, you have the right to not work here, you or yeah. he has the right not to keep you there. Christ has the right not to bring us there. Exactly. Since since we don't belong to ourselves, I have the right. It's my choice. It's no. It is your choice to make the right decision or not. But I mean, it's already been laid out for everyone. Uh, verse number thirteen: The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. This makes me think of scenes from movies, like comedies or something, where two people are holding shovels and one's the boss and the other one's the hired hand. He looks at the boss and drops the shovel and he's gone. That's what it makes me think of. However, i um, kind of joking about that, but there's a sadness in these two verses in, in Jesus saying this. What, 
does um, Jesus know that's coming? He knows that the shepherd is going to have to die for the sheep. He knows this. Um, <clears throat> and did what? In our metaphor, does a shepherd have lots of folks with them while they're doing the work all the time? No, the shepherd's by himself. <clears throat> Jesus was alone when he was betrayed. He was alone when he was denied. He was alone. He did this by himself. So. Jesus, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, he already knew exactly what was going to happen. When it was going to happen and how. So, every day he knew this was getting closer. Verse number 14. But still, Jesus continued on. Why? Because verse number 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. You can hear the determination in Jesus' voice in verse 14, 15. Uh, Jesus boldly told them, these meaning the Pharisees, again that he was the Son of God and that he would die or will die for the flock. And he told it right to their faces. Um, it's because we know he's speaking to the Pharisees here. Something popped into my head. Sometimes there's a you need to go easy with things and tread lightly, and other times you need to go full force and go firm. This was firm. 14 and 15 are very firm. Um, here Jesus showed that he was unmovable on this. Um, when it comes to the Bible, this is for our application, when it comes to the Bible and what it teaches today, we are to be the same way. We are to be <coughs> unmovable. We're to speak where it speaks and to be silent where it's silent. That goes back to, I have the right to do... No, you don't. Well, you can't tell me that. Yes, I can. Why? Well, what gives you the right? Well, the Bible tells me. Verse number 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Who are the other sheep? The Gentiles. Well, who was he talking about first then? The Jews. The Jew first, then to the Greek. <clears throat> I will bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be how many flocks? One. How many shepherd? One. Since we said already, the flock is the church. It's the body. How many bodies does Christ have? One. That body is his church. That body is the church. How many shepherds are there? One. How many heads does that body have? One. One shepherd, that is Christ. <coughs> so we're talking about the church of what? Christ. Verse number 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. What is the greatest act of love? John 15, 3, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Who said that? Jesus. What? What are the different types of love? I can't remember all of them. Filio. Which one are we talking about here? Agape. Love. The highest form of love. Sacrificial love. So, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Are we a friend of Jesus? <laughs> Body better get your hop their house big and nod your head fast. We better be friends of Jesus. God the Father so... Well, here, let's back up a little bit. The reason my Father, as God the Father, loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. God the Father so loves Jesus because he showed the highest form of love. And not only for his friends, but for all of mankind, for everyone. As we said, while they were, we were still lost. 
So, <clears throat> God's love for His Son in the flesh um, reached its consummation when Jesus gave Himself as a sacrifice for man's sins. That sacrifice was paid in death, and it was fulfilled when Jesus did what on the third day? He rose on the third day. Verse number 18, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. It's no secret there's a lot of people that are mad at Air quotes. The people that killed Jesus. The Romans and who? The Jews. There's a lot of people that don't like Jews because the Jews killed Jesus. So, I'm shaking my head. Or, yeah, shaking it. No, should we be mad at the Jews and the Romans who crucified Jesus? No. Did, who killed Jesus? The answer is no one. Jesus laid down his life. They didn't kill Jesus. No one killed Jesus. Christ gave his life voluntarily. He had the power to put it down and the power to take it up at will. Who else can say that? Nobody. 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 We talk about other religions when they believe in this is our... Who... This is the same thing. Who's, uh, who's still in the grave? All of them. Who is not? Jesus. You know, you know, God had gave Jesus a choice. If he wanted to pull out, he could have done it. Hmm? He did. But he, we know he, especially he wanted to be obedient to the Father and carry out the task. But he could have said any time, no. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, very true. Um, that was my last little point, and I don't, I don't have a closing statement. Maybe we can go through if anybody else has anything. But that's exactly what uh, the last little bit here is. Um, Christ gave his life voluntarily through voluntary obedience to God the Father. Look at that last, uh, the last sentence of that verse. This command I received of my Father. He was commanded to do this. But he didn't have to if he didn't want to. Are we, what are we commanded to do and not do? There's a lot of stuff we're commanded to do and not do. Do we have the choice to do it or not? Not really, but I mean, it, but we, can, we can or not. So Christ gave his life voluntarily through the voluntary obedience to God the Father, God the Son laid down His life that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we might have hope of being again. Anybody have anything else? Or we can go through one or two of the questions. I haven't even looked at that for years. Um, Never gotten that far. I just had a thought. When I was young, I didn't understand why Jesus taught in parables. Hmm? And then as I got older, Every year of your life, you have a bigger meaning out Yes. So, how I can understand it, as long as I live, I can still be getting a deeper meaning of that same parable. All mm-hmm. the people around right here, if they weren't the Pharisees, they could understand the shepherd's story. And the Pharisees did too. It's apparently, I don't know, not that I have any experience with it. It is very hard to teach people that how are you going to have a class of people that's why we have multiple classes that's why you have two kid classes for the kids and normally a teenage class and an adult class because you can't put them all in one room and everybody take the same thing from it that's right. but Jesus is the master teacher and he could teach I don't have that ability I don't think I ever could even if I went to school to be a teacher to be able to teach everyone where everyone got at least enough of it to be hungry for more and to always come back. And that's what Jesus did constantly with these metaphors and parables as well. Very good point. Who else? 
discussion questions. What similarities exist between the way Jesus cares for his people and the actions of a good shepherd? just the needs for the whole thing but the individuals as well they'll leave the entire flock to find the, they'll leave the 99 to find the one question number two how can we improve our knowledge of Jesus I'd say that's a huge question with a answer either that long or that short we're to to feed on his word hey, call me. yes sir oh good and further you know about the good shepherd you know the sheep know the voice you know I raised up in the country my dad always had horses mm-hmm. and, and he could horses could be down in the pasture and he could whistle mm-hmm. and they would come running I could do it some of them would come but he had one horse a stud horse, he was pretty hard here. Uh-huh. He wouldn't mind nobody but dad. Dad would call him and he would come running. But I called him, the brother called him, he wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. But dad all he had to do whistle. And he would come running, and dad would just open the gate and whistle, and he would follow him behind him in the truck all the way up to the house about a mile down the road. But he wouldn't do that for him. Yeah, that, that'll make you mad when that happens. We, like if you have a child, and I'll tell him, Corbin, come over here and do, and he's just like, just goes over there, and Heather will say it. He snaps too. Back before him, when we had all this dog and that dog and all these dogs, and we'd call them in, get inside, and they wouldn't come inside. Or two of them would come inside for her, and one wouldn't. And then it'd be, if I, if we flipped it, it'd be the same way around, and it'd just make you mad. Why does that anger you? Because they're not, why aren't they listening to you? Because you're not the boss of them. All right, time is up.